Let's pray. Father, this morning I'm reminded of the great prayer of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. In that he said, for this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. That you would be gifted with power, with strength in the inner person according to the spirit which lives within us, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith, and that being rooted and grounded in love, we would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the depth and breadth and the height and the length of love, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we would all be filled up to the fullness of God. And so, Father, this morning, I pray that over my church, which is your church, as well as those who have yet to come into our church, God, that we would know your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I would invite you this morning to please stand if you are able for the reading of God's word as we turn to 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 through 11. The apostle Paul or the apostle John says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God." The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, We also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you very, very much. As we continue this morning with part two from this passage of scripture, I want to begin by reviewing part one. And the first thing that I want to remind us of is the literary structure of these verses, which is that of recapitulation. I don't want to overemphasize this structure so that it becomes a distraction to us, but I do want us to see it in order to gain its full effect and to feel its full force in our lives. You may remember from part one that I defined recapitulation as the practice in writing where a thing is stated, and then it is restated in a similar way, yet with further information. And then these two statements work together to strengthen the argument of truth of what is being stated. Recapitulation. The example we used to show this was from Psalm 19, verse 1, which says this, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. There are two statements being made. The initial statement is being made that the heavens, which is the sky and the universe beyond, tells the story of God's glory. But then this statement is restated with a second statement with further detail by saying that the expanse of the heavens are declaring the work of the Lord. 
And these two statements working together through the principle of recapitulation serve to strengthen and further inform the argument of God's existence as well as our understanding of him as creator. This is an example of recapitulation contained in one single verse. And this is all over the Psalms, right? It's... it's uh, It's very specific to Hebrew way of writing. But here, what we have in our passage from 1 John is an example of recapitulation, not in one verse, but eight verses. In verses 7 through 10, which we covered last time, we have the first statement. And then in verses 11 through 14, which we're going to cover today, we have the restatement, both of which work together to bring us a very powerful statement about love. So again, I don't want to overemphasize the structure of recapitulation, right? If that's just a distraction to you, just forget it, whatever. But, but, but I do want you to hopefully see it in order to gain the full effect and the full force of what John is, is saying. So what is it that John has said? And again, by way of review, verses 7 through 10. In verses 7 through 10, we really have a three-point statement about biblical love, right? If we just kind of sift it all down to its basic form, this is what John is saying. First of all, that his foundational argument is given in verse 9, which says this, 1 John 4, 9, By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. John's argument for biblical love begins with the reality that it is God who initiated it. And how did God initiate it? Initiate it? He initiated it by manifesting it to us in a very specific way. And how did God manifest his love to us in a very specific way? By sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Now, let me pause from our, from John's logical progression to emphasize something about love in general and God's love specifically. And let me say this, that love, as we have defined it from Scripture, is not merely a feeling producing words. Anyone can say with words, I love you. Anybody can say that, right? An uncaring, unfeeling heart can go to the store and buy a Hallmark card which is able to very cleverly produce the words, I love you, but yet may have absolutely no personal emotional attachment whatsoever. I'm not saying words are worthless. And I'm not saying that Hallmark cards are bad. I enjoy getting cards. I enjoy giving cards, right? I'm a little bit old school, I guess. But what I am saying is that with love, it must be more than just words. The words spoken must have action rightly given in order to be proven to be truly love. If the actions don't line up with the words, then something went wrong. Something is wrong. Now, listen, young people. One day, you may have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And your relationship may progress to the point where the words are spoken, I love you. Giggle, giggle. But if the proof of that love is in words only, then you have every right to be suspicious of the true nature of their feelings. 
True love, which reflects godly love, will be proven and will be revealed through the way they treat you. If it is abusive, if it is manipulative, if it is disrespectful, then it may not be love at all. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love does not thrive in unrighteousness and so on and so forth. So my point, young person, or maybe old person, I don't know, is that before you give your heart away to someone, anyone who comes along and just says, hey, I love you, measure it. Measure it by their actions. Because their actions will either affirm their words as authentic, or it will expose their words as being empty and deceitful. Don't let people manipulate you with words. And so it is with God. He has not merely told his creation that he loves us in this book, right? He has said it a lot in this book. But he has not just spoken it with words. He has demonstrated it and expressed it beautifully through right action. And what is that right action? John says that action is that he has sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, into the world. This is so very, very important. The devil is a deceiver and a liar and is constantly roaring like a lion, trying to convince people that God does not love them. 1 Peter 5.8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour And he wants to devour you by telling you that God does not love you. And scripture also says that the devil is constantly working on the opposite front. Trying to convince God himself that his love for us should be abandoned. The devil is described in Scripture as the accuser of the brethren. In the accuser of the cistern, right? I made that word up, but you know what I mean. Accusing us before our God day and night, night and day. Did you see what they did? Did you hear what they said? God, they don't deserve your divine love. They're a bunch of sinners. Revelation 12.10, just one part of that phrase. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. There is a sense that yes, Lucifer has been cast out of heaven, but yet there is still a sense that he has an audience with God. Right? Read Job. He still has access to God in some form. And when he comes to God, what does he do? He accuses us before God night and day, day and night. Did you see what they did? Did you hear what they said? They do not deserve your love. But I love this verse in Revelation because what else does it say? It says that despite the devil's accusations, He has been thrown down. Despite his accusations against us to God, despite his accusations against us to us, the devil is defeated. See what the surrounding text says, verses 10 through 11, the full thing. 
Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the, underline it, authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And verse 11, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. And because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even when faced with death, I will not deny Christ, even if you want to take my physical life. (laughs) The blood of Jesus Christ has overcome the lying deceiver. The sacrifice of the Son of God has defeated that great dragon of old, namely Satan. The appearance of our Savior has crushed the head of the serpent. The angel of the Lord's army has thrown down the fallen angel, Lucifer, and will cast him into the lake of fire, where he will be tormented day and night forever, a just judgment for one who accuses God's elect day and night. Therefore... As sure as Christ has come into the world, and as sure as he has spilled his blood so that we may have life, so too we know, we know that God loves us. No matter how persuasive the lies of the devil may be. Here stands Christ the great expression and proof of God's love. Oh, devil, go ahead and lie away. Here stands Christ. Try to lie against that. He is Emmanuel, God with us. His very presence exposes the emptiness of the devil's lies. (laughs) What do you mean God hates me? Here stands Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in order to prove that God indeed loves me. I'm so tired of the devil trying to convince my church, trying to convince the people I care about that God does not love them. In the name of Jesus, get behind us, Satan. Here stands Christ. Okay, so back in John, unpause. (laughs) Back in John from verse 9, God's expression of love through Christ is emphasized even further in verse 10, 1 John 4.10, saying, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So again... It is God's love for us which initiates our love for him. And this through the sending of the Son, as we've already said, in order to be the propitiation for our sins. And we use this word often um, in sermons, in teachings, when we're reading our Bible. And we probably never use it when we're in casual conversation with one another. So, by way of definition, propitiation is the substitutionary sacrifice for sin, which effectively turns away the wrath of God. Because of our sin, the wrath of God rightly is focused on the sinner, right? But Christ, stepping in as a substitute in our place, received our deserved punishment. Right? Our iniquity was placed on him. Our punishment was placed on him. Our chastisement that we deserved was placed on him. Right? Read Isaiah. So in this way, Christ, as our propitiation, the wrath of God has been turned away from us as Christ stands as our advocate Mediating our sin forever. Christ always lives to make intercession for his people. And that intercession is not just 
prayer, but it is advocacy through the means of propitiation. Here Christ stands as the sacrifice which turns away the wrath of God. A great passage to help remember all of this is 1 John 2, 1 through 2. We preached about it several months ago. But by way of reminder, John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Right? The standard is this. Don't sin, church. But if anyone does sin, and we all will sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the, here's that word again, propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So this is a great truth, bringing life, bringing liberty, and is a passage worth memorizing. And uh, so propitiation. So by way of review, we're still tracking through uh, part one a couple weeks ago. Uh, So in all of this, finally, John brings us uh, to the conclusion in verses 7 through 8, saying this, 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is Love. So since love is from God, and God has indeed loved us, and his love has been proven beyond mere words because he has sent his son, therefore, John says, let us love one another. So the three-point progression in verses 7 through 10 is that first of all, God loves us. He has initiated the love. And God has also proven his love for us and in us by sending his son. And then thirdly, the third point of logical progression of John, John the philosopher, who knew? Therefore, having experienced God's love, that love in turn serves as the governing force of our lives like banks on a river leading and guiding the current of our existence. And to say it once again, let us love one another. We have experienced God's love. Therefore, let us love one one another. So that's essentially where we've been with these verses in part one. If you missed it or you want to hear it again, you can go to our YouTube channel or you can go to our church website and find that sermon in both places. And uh, okay, okay. So after that long review of part one, there's probably actually three sermons this morning. Anyway, after that long review of part one, we'll now move forward with verses 11 through 14, which gives us a parallel statement, but yet with further information, recapitulation, all of which serves to strengthen John's argument for us to love one another. Okay, so you still with me? Deep breath. I needed that more than you probably, but I'm the guy with leukemia, right? Sorry, bad joke. I'm 52. 50 also, yeah. Oh, this is going south, okay. We're going north. (laughs) Verse 11 of our passage today, 1 John 4, 11. John says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And it sounds like a broken record, doesn't it? This is a parallel statement to verse 7, mirroring the exact same truth. If God so loved us, which he did, Christ is proof, then we also love one another. So it's important to keep saying this, even though it may sound like a broken record, that if the love of God abides in us through Christ... God has initiated it, then the love of God must work through us to others. A great illustration of this is found at the end of John's gospel, the gospel of John chapter 21. In this chapter, we have that great reunion of Jesus and Peter. You may remember 
that the night in which Jesus was arrested and crucified, Peter had abandoned the Lord. In fact, he had not only abandoned the Lord, but he cursed and cussed, saying he did not know the man. And all of this before the rooster crowed, just as it was prophesied. But then came Peter's restoration from his blasphemy, which is recorded for us in John 21, verses 15 through 17. It says, so when they had finished breakfast, right, Jesus and the disciples, they're on the Sea of Galilee. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these, the other disciples? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. And Jesus said to Peter again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. Just as Peter had denied Jesus three times, Jesus now demands an affirmation and a confession from Peter three times. The substance of the affirmation is that of love. Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Peter, I know you rejected me. I know you abandoned me. I know you were being sifted like wheat by the devil and you failed. But tell me now, Peter, do you love me? To which Peter responds, yes, you know that I love you, Lord. I know I failed. I know I didn't keep my promise to you. I know I gave in to the lies of the devil. But Lord, please hear me now. Yes, I indeed do love you. You know this. And so the conclusion from the Lord is, then Peter Love me by loving my sheep. Peter, prove the love of God in you by serving my disciples. Be their shepherd. Peter, show the love of God in you by loving others in service to others. This beautiful, beautiful picture of the restoration of God to one who has failed God, is the principle and full illustration of what John is saying in 1 John. Do you love God, which is proof that God first loved you? If so, then love one another by serving one another in the capacity by which God gives. Don't get caught up in your failures. Repent. Return and receive Christ's restoration, and then let your forbearing spirit be put forth and love one another by serving one another, and do it with scandalous compassion. Just like Christ loved us with scandalous compassion. Oh, we may look and we may say, well, that person doesn't deserve love. 
neither do we. But God gave it anyway. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Love others. So this has been stated, restated abundantly. Hopefully maybe this story helps to just just blow that wide open. But it's so critically important and it's worth repeating again that if God so loved us with scandalous compassion, then we also ought to love one another with scandalous compassion. No, they don't deserve our love. Neither do we. Give it anyway. breaks my heart when we try to measure our ability to give love by whether somebody is worthy of it or not. It's not how God did it. That is not what God calls us to do. Love. Period. Hmm. Okay. Moving forward. In the next verse, John takes all of this a step further and a measure deeper, even though at this point we may not want to go deeper. But verse 12 says this, 1 John 4.12, No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another... God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. John makes an interesting statement here. Since mankind's fall in the Garden of Eden, our ability and even desire to see God and to know God has become hindered by sin. We're broken. On the one hand, because of sin, mankind seeks to hide from God. It was true of Adam and Eve in that when they heard the sound of God in the garden, what did they do? They tried to hide. We don't want God to see us, and we don't want to see Him for sure. And this remains true of us today. And that when we hear of God... We often try to remove ourselves from God by distorting the truth of God so that we can deceive ourselves into hiding from God. This is the insidiousness of our sinful nature. This is why we so easily embrace false teaching. We don't want to see God. The principle is rightly explained by John in his gospel. John 3, 19, 20 exposes our heart, blows it wide open for what it is. This is the judgment that the light, Christ, has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. We don't want the light of Christ exposing our evil deeds. It makes me feel bad. He goes on to say, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So on the one hand, in our fallen nature, we often seek to hide from God, which prevents us from seeing God. Going back to John's statement here in that no one has seen God, right? But on the other hand, in in a redeemed ongoing sanctification with Christ, when we do have those moments of seeking the face of God, right? That'd be this morning. That's why we're here, right? We come to church to seek the face of God, right? So when we do have those moments when we are honestly in the integrity of Christ seeking the face of God, there yet remains this principle that we cannot see him as clearly as our Christ-centered heart's desire, The sinful nature is still in the way, even if our hearts have been renewed and redeemed. 
It was true of Moses, who pleaded with God to be able to see his face. Lord, show me your glory. God, I want to see your glory. To which God replied, no. No sinfully corrupt man may see the fullness of my glory and live. You're a sinner, Moses. Yes, you're redeemed, but yet you are still a sinner. You are corrupt. And until that day of the second coming of Christ, you're going to remain corrupt. No man in this present state may see God and his fullness and live. It's the same statement which the Apostle Paul affirmed when he made, made it to Pastor Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.15, B through 16, speaking of Christ, saying, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, which no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So while we may desire, we may have the Christ-centered desire to see the fullness of the glory of God in our current fleshly fallen state, we can't. So there's a twofold reason why John makes this statement that no man has seen God. Whether it's in our sinful condition, we just really don't want to see him. Right, Because i got this little hidden sin over here that I don't want to have exposed. So I'm going to twist his truth a little bit so that I can make it say what I want it to say so that my sin isn't revealed. Or if it's the other reason that in our fallen condition we want to see God, but we just simply can't because of our current nature. Either way, John points out plainly, no one has seen God at any time. Do you feel that? Because then John drops a bomb with the force of a nuclear warhead and blows the whole thing apart with this astounding truth. Though we have not and cannot see God, when we love one another, it is evidence and proof that God is present and may be seen. <laughs> okay, this probably goes beyond my powers of philosophical contemplation, but let me give it the old college try. You be the judge, and let me suggest this as what John is saying. When we love one another, our state of being goes from that of no one seeing God at any time to that of God is manifested for everyone to see. Right? We cannot see God. Therefore, many people argue that there must not be a God. Right? If you can't see it, then it must not be real. It must not exist. That's their logic. That's their argument. But yet, Scripture argues that the reality of the existence of God is seen everywhere. <laughs> Consider the statement of just Romans 1.20. One verse, right? I mean, we could go acres, acres of Scripture. But I'll give you, just give you one, right? It says this, Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world... God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, all of creation, specifically mankind, is without excuse when they argue that God is not real. Can't see him, he must not be real. Romans 1.20 begs to differ. So while God remains unseen by fallen man, 
It says here that his attributes, his power, and his divine nature are all clearly seen, right? Psalm 19.1 would be a good place to go. And he can be understood through what has been created. Not just seen, but understood. Now follow this closely, right? Follow this closely. John. John argues... That when we love one another truly and in a biblical, godly way, we become the vessel of God by which God is revealed to the world for the world to see. Scripture says that God is revealed clearly through his attributes, power, and nature. And of those, love is at the top of the list. God is love, John says. And furthermore, God has chosen to disclose himself, reveal himself to his creation through his creation, of which mankind is at the top of his created order, being made just a little lower than the angels, Hebrews says. Therefore, when his born-again, mind-renewed, heart-transformed people love with the scandalous, compassionate love of Christ, it screams at the world, look, there's God. (laughs) See him. Did you see How that Christian loved that person by serving them in their time of need. The invisible God is being made visible. Did you see how that Christian loved that person by speaking the truth to pull them out of darkness into his glorious light? Therefore, the invisible God is being made visible. Did you see how that Christian loved that person by being their advocate against a harsh, cruel, and murderous world? Therefore, the invisible God is being made visible. And I could go on and on and on. Here is the radical truth which I believe John is declaring. You test it. By the love of God, working through us in loving others, The world is given a vivid glimpse of God. John says, no one has seen God. But when we love one another, it proves that God abides in us and his love is being perfected in us. Look. Look at the church world There's God. See them love. God dwells in them. And so we ask, well, how how is this possible? If I'm right, if I'm right, how? How does God, the unseen, invisible God, take sinners such as us, redeem them, and use them so that he may be seen to the world? That's incredible. So we ask, how is this possible? To which John answers in our final two verses this morning. I keep looking at the clock, but it's broken. I still have 20 minutes. <laughs> hey, we got, let's see, we got 2 John, 3 John. Anyway. Um. <laughs> right, right. You got to love me. <laughs> After this sermon, you better. <laughs> Verse 13, John says this, By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So we know, let's track it here, so we know from verse 12, that by the evidence of God's love, that God is truly abiding in us, 
and is being made visible to the world around us. But here in verse 13, we are given the answer for how in the world is this possible? And the answer is the Holy Spirit. Now let me back up, establish a principle, help us to see it. As I have mentioned, it is important for us to read things in the Bible in the context in which it has been written, right? We do this with normal books, but sometimes for some reason we come to the Bible and we pull stuff out of context all the time, right? We would never do that with Tom Sawyer, right? But we do it with the Bible all the time. So let me just repeat this principle again, right? Words live in sentences. Sentences live in paragraphs. Paragraphs live in chapters. Chapters live in books, and books live in harmony in this book, the Bible. Context. So, with verse 13, it may be tempting to take it, pull it out of context, and use it as a standalone verse. But our healthy hermeneutic of context dictates that we consider it in the light of the surrounding verses. And when we do that, we find that this statement is guided and governed by the topic of love, and more specifically, that of loving others. Okay? You need to keep it in that. And in that, we come away with a certain question. Why does John connect... The love of God, which he has already talked about a lot. The love of others, which he has also talked about a lot. And now, the gift of the Holy Spirit as being the true knowledge that God indeed abides in us. Right? How are these three connected? The short answer, we could go down the long path, but I'll give you the short answer is that because in addition to the love of the Father being manifested through the sending of the Son, and the love of the Son being manifested through His sacrificial propitiating death, we now see that the love of the Holy Spirit is being manifested through us in power to be able to love others through us. And as he loves others through us, it then becomes further evidence that God truly abides in us. So John brings in the Holy Spirit completing this Trinitarian work of God's love into the life of the Christian. And it's just beautiful. Right? Not only is it the Father sending the Son, not only is it the Son dying a propitiating death, but now we understand that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has a role in this whole thing also, and it just comes together beautifully. John. Let me try to explain. Jesus promised that it was to our benefit that he go away in the sense of his ascending to the Father after the resurrection. And why did he say that this would be to our advantage that he go away? It was because he would send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who would be with us forever. Right? Uh, John 16, 7. Jesus speaking says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so so he points out that this is all for your benefit. That I go to the grave, three days later I rise, and then 40 days later I ascend to the Father. Because when I ascend to the Father, I am going to petition to the Father that the Holy Spirit be sent. And so, now that the Spirit has come, as the Son has promised, we have great blessings and power as the church. Amen? Amen? We are technically a Pentecostal church, which is a church of the Holy Spirit. We celebrate the day of Pentecost, and we believe it is still here today. The power of God living in God's people. So we have many blessings, many much power. 
To name a few, from the Spirit, we have power to be witnesses of Christ to the world. We have power to know the truth. We have power to mortify the flesh, right? Kill it. How are you going to kill it? Ask for the Spirit to help. He'll be more than glad to help you. (laughs) We have power for resurrection. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. And one day Christ is going to come and he is going to speak and the power of the Spirit of God in us will raise us to life. We have power furthermore for supernatural gifts, gifts of prophecy and tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And we also have the power for spiritual fruit, which is where we want to land the plane in this discussion. And I still have 20 minutes, so I don't know. (laughs) I'm sorry. Oh. We have power for spiritual fruit, right? Because the Holy Spirit has been sent. This is our advantage that Jesus spoke of. So you may remember from Jesse's sermon last week that he spoke from Galatians 5 about the fruits of the flesh as well as the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? The caution is given in that passage that if one continually, habitually practices walking in the deeds of the flesh, running in the deeds of the flesh even, they will die an eternal death in judgment apart from the kingdom of heaven. Right? That's the danger. That is the warning. That is the great caution that Paul sounds in Galatians 5. But yet, on the other hand, if one is walking in an ongoing, growing, escalating, sanctifying way in the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit produces evidence of eternal life, which is manifested by nine healthy spiritual fruits. And of those fruits, which one is at the top of the list? Love. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. One of the powerful blessings of the Holy Spirit in our lives is his work of causing us to bear the spiritual fruit of love. We need to understand this. The Father has done his work. The Son has done his work. The Spirit is doing his work. Therefore, it is my contention that John is drawing our attention to this in his reference of the Holy Spirit in his explanation of love. Yes, the love of God is manifested in the Father by the sending of the Son. I'll say it again. Yes, the love of God is manifested in the Son by his sacrifice on the cross. And now, furthermore, yes, we see that the love of God is manifested in the Holy Spirit by causing us to bear the fruit of love. Therefore, to conclude the whole matter, again, by way of summary, God has initiated his love for us by sending his son to save the world. As a result of experiencing God's love firsthand, we love one another with scandalous compassion. And now the final point is being made by John that the way we do this is through the power of the Holy Spirit as he produces the fruit of love within us and through us. And what is the ultimate expression and the focus of our love to one another It is that of Jesus, who said one doesn't have any greater love than this, than that one lay down his life for his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrificially give everything so that they may live. Again, so much more can be said. It's worthy of many books to be written on the topic. But I'll just simply maybe say this by way of application. I still have 20 minutes. (laughs) 
(laughs) True, godly, biblical love is not an addition to the life of a Christian. It's not an option. It's not like we can come to the table and say, well, I can eat this, I can eat that, I can eat this. No, that, that's not it. Love is at the core of who we are as Christians. It is, it is not like a seasoning that you can put on a ribeye steak to make it better, right? Well, they're a Christian, but they're a really good Christian because they have love. They don't have love, but they do have love, so that's not. Instead, love, like it is for God, is part of the state of being of the Christian. It is our essence. It is one of the very ontological essences. Google it. I don't have time to explain it. Of a person that that it proves who we truly are in Christ and that we have truly received of the Spirit. A ribeye steak can be a ribeye steak without seasoning, but a Christian cannot be a Christian without love. It is as Jesus himself said by this, all men, the whole world, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So, application, do you love Jesus? But yet, do you struggle to love others as Jesus loves you? Yes. Then the answer from John is to ask the Holy Spirit for help. Ask him to produce the spiritual fruit of love in your life and he will be happy to help you. The world needs your love, church. It needs to see God through you. So go and love well and let them see the Lord. Amen? Worship team, would you please come? This morning, we want to take a moment of reflection before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We want to contemplate what the Word of God has said. We want to bring our inadequacies before the Lord. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I'm really convicted up here. (laughs) And then when you're ready, please come and get your communion elements. And hang on to them and we'll celebrate together. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness towards us. God, that you have loved us. And yet you love us in such a way that you're not willing to leave us the same. You have sent your Holy Spirit into our lives to change us. To transform us into the image of your Son. And Father, I confess as I'm sure the rest of the church confesses, that, Lord, we often don't love one another as we should with scandalous compassion. Holy Spirit, help us. Teach us to love like Jesus loved. And forgive us when we don't. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.